All right, let's try this one more time, guys. This is Jose Trujillo. I am the world's greatest living artist, and I wanted to show you this print uh, of a painting by none other than Van Gogh. Here we go. I'm back. <laughs> I'm back. <laughs> this is fishing boats on the beach at St. Uh, Marie de la Mer. Uh, that's my French for you guys. That's as good as my French gets. So as I was mentioning in the video before, before I, I, I turned this off, uh, I saw this painting. It's, it's really, I mean, I like to do these videos on some of my favorite artworks. I saw this painting in a museum in LA. How's it going, Catalina? Catalina Henisa. How's it going, uh... Kai Sam Sampson. I hope I hope I'm not butchering your guys' names. I apologize if I do with my pronunciations. So I saw this painting in, in in LA. It was just, you know, it's one of those paintings that you know you're seeing at Van Gogh. I know that this is a famous painting. I know that a lot of people know this painting. But it's not until you're in front of it that you actually see the textures. The textures are incredible and they don't really, you can't really see them here, right? It, it doesn't matter if you're looking at a high resolution print, you won't really see them. But I'm going to talk to you a little bit about it. One of the reasons this is one of my favorite paintings is because there are a lot of people out there saying that Van Gogh paints like a child and, you know, all just... Just really negative talk about Van Gogh. And I think, you know, give the guy a break. Give the, the, give the guy a break and give him a chance. Just look at the composition of this piece. It's the composition that really just, you know, it just, it blows me away. Because he's using, he's breaking the rules. And at the same time, he's using very old techniques. Very, very old techniques. This is almost a uh, something that, you know, one of the great masters like Caravaggio would have used. Which is, not only does he use, he, he, cuts, he cuts the landscape or the seascape in this, this, um, in this example. He cuts it right in the middle, which, is, which was a very, very modern thing to do. Most used what it was a uh, called still people a lot of a lot of people still use that the rule of thirds, which they would have put the horizon line lower or higher, making the sky low, making the sky you know thinner over here, and or making the landscape thinner down here and the sky larger. Someone who used to do that a lot, making this making the skies much larger, was of course John Constable, a great Romantic painter. Uh, and and uh, Monet's Monet's mentor was very very famous for doing that. But what was Monet's thing? Monet's uh, mentor's name? Oh my god, I forgot his name. Anyways, if you guys remember his name, please let me know. I completely forgot uh, Monet's uh, mentor's name. But anyways, they used to they used to do things differently, and Van Gogh just sliced it in half very very modern very contemporary you know there was a just a different thing no one was doing uh, and if they were doing it they were using very um very strategic placement of their objects as he did right here it's extremely strategic the way that he brings forward right it's almost it's almost an arrow so what he's creating is tension he's creating tension bringing this two bolts this way right bring him this way while at the same time having this posts point to where the sails are going right so it's a very it's a very cool it's a very cool technique or um, composition technique which creates tension uh, Goya was a master at doing that and of course as we know a lot of the a lot of the French painters love the Spanish painters as Velázquez and Goya and uh and we can see some of the some of the techniques used. And this is I'm not saying that he painted in this technique. What I'm saying is the compositions. The technique, of course, he was very much into Japanese art, as most of the impressionists were. 
most of the impressionists were into Japanese art during this time, during this period, because it was a thing. It was a modern thing. It was the contemporary thing to do. And and uh, remember that these artists were no BS artists. Like uh, many times uh, today, everybody gets afraid of using colors for for interior decor, interior design. Uh, many artists are like, oh my God, I don't want my painting to be used over a sofa. This artist painted with that idea. Many of these artists did. You know, Monet, Monet certainly did, and, and, and Renoir, and Van Gogh did. And even though he wasn't sacrificing uh, his, his, his eye, he wasn't sacrificing his passion, uh, his vision, let's call it that, he still painted, he still painted what was in fashion because you can't get away from your time. He was a man of his time. Even though he was ahead of his time, he was still a man of his time. He still understood what was happening, the colors that were being used, you know. He was using modern colors. He was he was using modern techniques. He was using modern composition. It was a completely different way of seeing the world. And although we know him as being a post-impressionist, I think some of his paintings, some of his paintings, I love that, amen. <laughs> some of his paintings are more, uh, in my point of view, are more fauvist. Are just a bit more fauvist, right? They, they, they have that those colors that just are uh, very. They're not just bright. Um, they are hard on the eyes. Like this yellow, this yellow post is extremely hard, right? If you see this live, you can you can definitely see the how it just it just pops up. You know, it just pops out. And not because it's this not because it's vertical and, and extremely well placed using the rule of thirds, creating an X right here. Right? Extremely well placed. He understood what he was doing. He understood composition very well. And uh but he made sure to put the color that will that will almost hurt your eyes right where the eye will naturally go in a composition using any 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 type of uh uh simple composition such as the the rule of thirds or an s composition i don't think right here he was he was also letting us you know bringing us not just because of the water but the way he was bringing us it's almost this could almost be a pathway right if this was a landscape this could almost be a pathway a trail and man this guy knew what he was doing and this is one of the reasons why i love this painting because here it's almost like a little uh if he was a writer this would be a this would be a, a great paper or almost a manifesto saying look look i know what i'm doing i'm just choosing to be in the trenches as galgan anyone who's seen galgan's earliest or earlier works you can you you know you don't you don't see Galgan with the same eyes. You see Galgan differently. You, you understand that the guy understood realism and then bent the rules, right? And, and nowadays, we don't need to go through that. Of course, this was, this was the status quo, right? You first learn realism and then you go bend the rules. Nowadays, it doesn't work that way. You don't have to go learn realism. You don't have to go learn... Uh, I'm sure that it would help you. Why not? But it's not a must, for these guys, it was a must. If you wanted to study art, you first have to go, you know, you have to go through certain uh, uh, skill levels and certain uh, certain things you had to do, right? Certain techniques, certain schools. And the school that was happening during this people's time was uh, realism. It was the, the very much, um, I guess, uh, very much... Uh, Made the staple by by artists like um, Corbet, Gustave Corbet. Corbet was the guy who was uh, at the forefront of that. You know, it was sort of uh, almost naturalistic realism, but but it was very very strong. And these guys, you know, they didn't even want to use the same colors. You know, they, many of them didn't didn't even want to use. Um, Earth tones. They didn't want to use black. They didn't want to, you know, and, and again, this is the impressionist. But the post-impressionists like Van Gogh and, and Seurat and Gauguin, this these guys were actually, you know, saying, "Look, it's not the colors. It's not this. It's not that. It's that these people are trying to paint what's in front of them, 
and and the post impressionists like in this painting they're they're trying to see beyond that they're trying to see beyond just what you think you're watching whatever you think you're seeing try to see a little bit beyond and and the only way you can see beyond is by suspending as i'm always talking about suspending the mind a little bit because now you start looking into what you're feeling right what is the feeling and I love what he did with the boats here because they almost seem uh, like if if they have a very two dimensional you know feeling to them, and this is due, I believe, because of the Japanese influence, the Japanese art. It's, it's almost two dimensional, just beautiful. It's almost like a sticker, like if he got a sticker and he just placed it right here, right? He did a very traditional, almost very traditional landscape, and of course he created three dimension, but but the line. Leaving almost no shadow. Look at the shadow. The shadows. It turns out to be oh, my dirty nails. It turns out to be a, a sort of a, a burnt sienna. You know, he's not even using what normally Monet would have used. Even Monet was still trying to keep some of the realism and some of the three dimensional, you know, aspects of a painting. Monet would probably use some sort of purple down here with some earth tones in the beginning of his career, anyways. And Van Gogh, Van Gogh completely moved away from that. But but yet using something very dark, right? Possibly a, a, a looks like looks like blue and black. Extremely dark down here. We can see it over here too. He's not afraid of using black where where Monet, right? They even had a song against using using the color black because they were they were upset with the ideas of Gustave Courbet. And using using earth tones and very dark tones in order to create reality. The impressionists were saying, "Look, we can create reality with many different colors, right? Not just not just uh, not just using dark tones. We can create, you know, we can we can see sh we can see the blue in the shadows. We can see violet. Right? We can see yellow. Where do you see? I don't know a, a flesh tone. We actually see yellow, and." Again, these guys were very much influenced by a group of artists, uh, by the Spanish painters. I'm, I'm talking about the post-impressionist and the impressionist. In this case, of course, this is a post-impressionist painting. But they were very much influenced by, by Spanish painters and influenced, very, very much influenced by Eugène de la Croix, uh, one of the probably uh, biggest, you know, baddest names in the in the art world during that time he was a romantic french painter very uh he's an aristocrat he's like a he was like a like a pinky up type of guy pinky up <laughs> he, 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 was, he was a strange dude very interesting um life if you ever had a chance to have a chance to uh read about him but you know again Using that, right? Using the ideas of Delacroix, because Delacroix was very... I, I think he, he's considered the first colorist. And colorists are people that are using color in order to create... Uh, uh, in order to express three-dimensional um, ideas or objects, rather than just using, you know, very dark reds or oranges or black. They're using green. They actually, you could see in some of the paintings by Delacroix, some of his figurative paintings, he was actually using some greens like this. And Van Gogh loved Delacroix. Some of these greens you see in the flesh of uh, some of uh, Delacroix's figurative paintings. It's a very cool thing. I love how the, the, the poles, to hear the poles from the sails, uh, the fishing boats, right? Are just going that way, and, and and you know, kind of taking you, but then the water kind of brings you back. It's just a beautiful, you know. I think it's, I think he's trying to say, look, guys, I can paint. <laughs> For those of you who think I can't, I actually can paint. I know what I'm doing. I understand composition. I'm just bending the rules, you know. I think Van Gogh was very much. Um, if Van Gogh was music, <laughs> he would be like, I don't know, like Tom York or something. <laughs> if Van Gogh was music, yeah, for sure. You know, this would be like, I don't know, 
Pablo Hani or something. <laughs> you know what he was doing. He understood it very well. This painting, of course, was painted in 1888. And still today, people uh, find it hard, right? Find it hard to understand its beauty for some reason. Because many, 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 many people get stuck in the idea of representation. And he, you know, in this type of paintings, we find that merch because they're butterflies, right? These artists are butterflies. Remember, after this, we were starting to see Picasso. We started, we started, well, first we start to see the Fauvists, right? Start to see Matisse playing with, just, just playing with color. We start to see some of the Fauvists painters. And then we start to see, you know, what Picasso was doing and, and Brock and, and also Matisse. And... So this is almost, I, I like to call it a fulcrum point, right? This is almost a, a, a time where things are going to start bending. And we actually get to see, we actually get to see uh, the cocoon, I guess. <laughs> I like to call it that for now. Breaking, you know, the, the, the shell breaking and the butterfly coming out. Because I don't think I don't think we saw it in the impressionists. Now we saw it in the we saw it in the impressionists, but in their later years, we were able to see uh, how they transcended realism. That's what I'm talking about. Okay, please uh, don't get lost on me here. Uh, don't think I'm losing you. I'm talking about how this artist transcended the idea of representational art through means of realism, which was the school of the time. Uh, many other artists did not did not. Uh, transcend uh, one of one of the artists that didn't transcend for sure was was John Singer Sargent master master artist did not transcend to this degree okay he did transcend in his own artwork but he didn't transcend to this degree where where a lot of these artists were butterflies they were saying you know what the hell with the idea of realism to hell with all of this all of these restrictions and, and you know restraints we are going to start going on a different path. And yet they're still they're still afraid. It's uncontested water. You know, it's deep water. They're still afraid because look at the landscape. It's it's just a beautiful, well represented landscape. It's just so well done. The seascape is what I'm talking about, but I'm gonna call it landscape just because it feels right, because it's horizontal. So it's it's almost like this this bit of fear, right? What do we do? What do we leave out and what do we keep? Right? I, I could almost imagine them saying, What do I leave out? What do I keep? Right? I needed to I needed to remain somewhat realistic. I want some elements to be representational. But but you can see the switch. You can start seeing the switch in this in these paintings. And and of course, in many of his later paintings, you definitely see the jump, right? They make some quantum leaps from realism to just abstraction. And, and we see that with the first Impressionists, of course. We see that with Monet. We see that with Renoir. Renoir taking, taking uh, Cezanne. We saw that with Cezanne, definitely. Taking figurative work all the way from, from very representational, right? Very realistic. All the way to almost Cubist, right? That's why Cezanne was called the father. I think Matisse was the one who dubbed that. I think Matisse was the one who said Cezanne was father to, to us all, meaning all the modern painters. Um, if, if Cezanne was the father, then Van Gogh was the uncle. Because... That uncle, right? <laughs> the, the uncle, the philosopher uncle who drank too much and couldn't 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 put his shit together. That was that was Van Gogh. <laughs> it's okay, good boy. So, and look, he understood it so well as well because we can see also the red and the blue, right? How he's he's creating that uh, orange blue. Has putting some red in the sea, and just you know, just making it so damn obvious that he knows what he's doing, but still 
leaving it, right? Leaving some for interpretation. Leaving, leaving some, not a lot, but some. I think at this point he's playing more with with um, how because you know he became a master at it with his figurative work also how can you represent something three dimensional and still make it look two dimensional again like like uh, a lot of the Japanese woodcuts and and artwork that was very very famous during this time. How can you do that? In a way, they were trying to simplify, right? They were, they were, they were cutting the fat, the BS, and 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 Van Gogh was at the trenches, and so was Gauguin, cutting the fat, right? As as Picasso said, painting is the elimination of the unnecessary, and this is what these guys were doing, and you could see it right here. This is what you know blows me away. You can actually see it happening. Right. There's no there's no movie. We're not seeing it. It's okay, good boy. We're not seeing it in a movie, but we can see it in frame by frame, right? Each painting is a frame. Saludos desde Quito, Ecuador. Muy bonita picture. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias a uh, Anita Maria Gudino. How a good boy. My dog is like barking. Too. I don't know who. So. I'm trying to get him in his kennel because he needs, he needs to go to sleep anyways. I think he goes rest about this time. So he's getting antsy. He doesn't like the noises outside. So there you guys have it. My name is Jose Trujillo, you guys. I'm the world's greatest living artist. I wanted to make this little short video. I think I made it a little long, but whatever. If you enjoy it, you enjoy it. Give it a thumbs up. I, I think here, uh, some of it is thumbs up. Some of it is uh, tag a friend who might like this, who might want to you know, hang out in some of these talks. Because I, I want to talk about different stuff. As an artist, there's different things that we... You know, it's not just creating artwork. It's also observing artwork. It's also... Um, sharing it's not just I'm not I'm not just I don't just paint because I'm a painter and I'm an artist and I I know you are too many of you are artists and there's different ways of experiencing what we do and one way is to observe and I like to observe certain paintings paintings that I love and this is not an academic approach by any means I don't I don't know when exactly this, what month this was painted and what was going on through his head. I'm not much interested in that kind of stuff. I'm, I'm interested in what, as an artist, I can, I can grab on, right? What I can, what I can actually uh, soak and, and uh, use it in my own experience and understand what's happening. And of course, I know a little bit about the history, but it's not, that's not my approach. I'm not a historian or art historian, you know, academic in any way. I'm just a painter, and but I like I like looking at some of this artwork and talk about it. So I'm gonna leave you guys with that. Take care, and have a great day. Adios.